idea. Oh, hi. Okay. Hi. Welcome to the gym. Uh, this bi-weekly podcast is about the many and varied schemes of the many and varied U.S. law enforcement and intelligence agencies, organizations, and committees, and how they are stupid and funny. Join us on our merry journey through space and time. Hi, my name is Barry. You might recognize me as the guy who keeps showing up at Eddie Izzard gigs. <laughs> True story. It's not a joke. It's just yeah. it's me showing up. Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Seamus. Uh, you may recognize me from Stormtrooper 1138 from Episode 8 of Star Wars. <laughs> That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I recognized you like down in the, in the pack of. Oh, there he is. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Good for you. I'm, I'm, I'm the one I always miss every time he's shot. So. That's not just. You're not alone there, are you? What do you mean? We're not here to discuss stormtroopers. Okay. We're here to talk about uh, the Palmer raids. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, good, good, so. good because that's what we arranged. Uh, yesterday, you showed me the script. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Surprise! No. Right. Um, We're talking about something else entirely, you idiot. Yeah. So, all right. So, our story begins uh, at the birth of our hero, or one of the heroes. There's a lot of people in the story. Uh, okay. So, uh, strap in, boys uh, and and ladies. Uh, May fourth, eighteen seventy two. Alexander Mitchell Palmer was born into a Quaker family in the small town of Moosehead, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was educated in public schools, graduated from uh, Swarthmore College in 1891. After graduation, he was appointed the court stenographer of the Pennsylvania 43rd Judicial District uh, Court. He studied the law at Lafayette College and Georgetown, or sorry, George Washington University. He was admitted to the Pennsylvania Bar of Association in 1893 and began practicing in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. Palmer also served as a director on several boards, uh, including uh, several banks uh, and other businesses. He became active in politics as a Democrat and was a member of the executive committee of the Pennsylvania State Democratic Committee. So shit's happening quick and fast for this guy. Right? Mm. Right also, uh, should we point out that this ah. was uh, before the 1960s when the Democratic and the Republican Party kind of switched identities? Right. right. So before the 1960s or before the Southern strategy, Nixon's Southern strategy, yep. um, what we now associate as Republican values would have been Democrat values. And and I guess if you want to look at the other way around, not, not this doesn't track exactly, but that's kind of the feeling you want to get. Like there, there wouldn't have been anything particularly left wing about the Democratic Party exactly. in 1893. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, so yeah, this is a picture of our gentleman. I can't really find any uh, young pictures of him. So he oh, he looks cool. Like oh, ah, that's that's. I was not expecting that. Yeah, he always looks. Uh, he looks a bit like FDR, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. A little, little heavier though. Mm -hmm. uh, la, 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 la. Palmer was elected to Congress. He served as a vice chairman of the Democratic Congressional C Campaign Committee in his first term. Managed uh, the assignment of the office space in the second term. Uh, he rose to power under Woodrow Wilson administration and he asked for the position of attorney general, uh, but was instead offered secretary of war. Hmm. He declined, citing his Quaker beliefs and heritage. He wrote uh, to the president. Would you mind uh, reading the quote read this there? Part of it. Here? Please. Okay, do you want me to do my 1893 American, upper class American voice? Of course. As a Quaker war secretary, I should consider myself a living illustration of a horrible incongruity. In case our country should come into armed conflict with any other, I would go as far as any man in her defense, but I cannot, without violating every tradition of my people and going against every instinct of my nature, planted there by heredity, environment, and training, sit down in cold blood in an executive position and use such talents as I possess to the work of preparing for such a conflict. Well done. Thank you. So it sounds like a real principled man, you know? Mm, it sounds like Bane and Batman. Yeah. <laughs> before you got, uh, before we get into the story, we also need to talk. Uh, you know, covers a little background, right? Uh, I don't know if you heard about this little disagreement among, amongst uh, cousins from 1914 to 1918. It was called World War One. Have you heard of this, Barry? World War One. Uh, yes, I'm aware of World War One. World War One was called the First World War before there uh -huh. was a Second World War. Did you know that? Right. Yep. It was the end of end all wars. It was so yes. great we had a second. So, yes, yeah. they, they, they yeah. didn't get it right the first time, and they had to yep. do a mopping up operation, and they call that the yep. second one, yeah. Uh, during World War I uh, in the U.S., there was a surge of nationalism. Surprise! Mm. Uh, I am sure none of this is relative 
relative to anything that's going on today. Oh, this is so. a decade ago. Yeah, yeah. So just try to imagine. Surge of nationalism in America. Yeah, hmm. yeah just, just know, try to imagine. Yeah, okay. Uh, this campaign in the U.S. Uh, railed against uh, the real and imaginary divided political loyalties of immigrants in ethnic groups. Imagine, uh, divided right? loyalties. That old yep, trick. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Uh, a group of folks under this umbrella were called hyphenated Americans. Hyphenated Americans. What a term. Uh, the term mm. hyphenated American was first used in 1889 and was common as a derogatory term, shocker, uh, by 1904. During World War I, the issue arose of the political loyalties of those with close ties to Europe, especially German Americans. There's a hyphen. Uh, in 1915, a former U.S. Uh, president, Theodore Roosevelt, speaking to the largely, the largely Irish Catholic Knights of Columbus yeah, at right. Carnegie Hall on Columbus Day asserted that. Uh, do you want to read this one? Sure, yeah. Do you want me to yep. do it like as the 1893 Bane or? However you can do it. I've, however you want to do Theodore Roosevelt in this. Teddy Roosevelt said this. Um, there is no room in this country for hyphenated Americanism. When I refer to hyphenated Americans, I do not refer to naturalized Americans. Some of the very best Americans. Oh, sorry. Is, is, is he going to do the some of my best friends thing? Uh, <laughs> some of the very best Americans I have ever known were naturalized Americans. Americans born abroad. There is no such thing as a hyphenated American who is a good American. <clears throat> the only man who is a good American is the man who is an American and nothing else. Sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> man, that's, that's, that's rough. That's a rough read. Yeah, uh, it gets gets worse because uh, <laughs> because uh, President Woodrow Wilson. Now, if you heard about this piece of shit, uh, uh, about Wilson, we're going to mention him again in a different yeah, show. Yeah, that for no uh, charge. Uh, right. Uh, he regarded high, uh, yeah, hyphenated Americans uh, with suspicion. Uh, do you want to read this once? Yeah, go for it. Okay, this is from Woodrow Wilson. Now, I should warn you, Woodrow Wilson is a completely different person. It's going to sound like Teddy Roosevelt, but he's a completely different guy. Okay. <laughs> Any man who any man who carries a hyphen about with him carries a dagger that he is ready to plunge into the vitals of this republic whenever he gets ready. That's that's fight and talk though. I'm despite this stupid yeah. accent I'm doing. That is that's a terrible thing to say about a group of people in his country. Yep. Uh, he also threw more some more shade. Uh, you wanna like hit you, him you with hear this a lot time. about the you know the Japanese internment camps during yep. the war. Those yep. people were American citizens. Yep. And as far as I know, there was Germans in various holding facilities as well, around the country, as well as Japanese people. Oh yeah, but they, they didn't. The Americans did not lick all, that all of that off the stones. This was the fact, the first instance of all that kind of thing. Hyphenated Americans. It's a racist, horrible thing. Yep. Because nobody would talk about English Americans. You don't hear that though, because they're just Americans. You know. <laughs> uh. So he had some more shade there to throw. I don't know if you want to. Do you want me to go? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to hang on. This is the yeah. script you gave me. Wilson uh -huh. threw more shade by referring to such folks as having poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life. And then he said, such creatures of passion, disloyalty, and anarchy must be crushed out. Well, that's, that's, that's genocidal talk. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty what, bad. What a gem. Hmm. Uh, an another fear uh, hampering of Woody or won't uh, won't he uh, Wilson's chill uh, was another Woody possibly <laughs> some uh, some would say overhyped movement uh, in history uh, known as uh, the Russian Revolution, aka the Bolshevik Revolution. What do you mean overhyped? <laughs> <laughs> Surely it was hyped. Oh correctly. come on, come on! You Nothing will come from it, you know. It's just it's just yeah. a bunch of peasants. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, Wilson saw this as a war cry to labor agitators, anarchists, and communists. By uh, labor totally agitators, he means unionists, right? Exactly. Right. Uh, totally unrelated, I'm sure you would say, uh, say during uh, 1917 and 1918, the Wilson administration passed the Warrior Measures Act, the Espionage Act, and the Sedition Act. Ah, uh, the Sedition Act, yeah. Yep. Uh, legislation enables sweeping surveillance and prosecution of dissenters, and perceived subversives. The good news is that in mo the modern United States, they would never pass legislation that enables sweeping <laughs> surveillance, right? <laughs> so that's, right. That's true, right? This is 1918, yeah. 1917, folks. Those we'll days never are gone. See, we'll never see those acts mentioned again no, in the modern no, no. We learned our lesson, right? Yep. 
the 1919's uh, Seattle general sh uh, strike also added fuel to Wilson's concerns about pro labor rise. If that wasn't enough, uh, poor Woody, uh, but not as cool as Harrelson, Wilson, uh, also had to deal with the Gallon. Do you have like a little nickname for every mention of Woodrow Wilson? I'm like trying. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so Luigi uh, Galliani uh, was born in Italy and, and emigrated to the U.S. in 1901. Uh, he became a leading voice of anarchism in the anti-war movement, declaring that the anarchist movement was against the war, against the peace, and for social revolution. Uh, in response to uh, the Selective Service Act of uh, 1917, which is basically for the draft and whatnot, right? Did uh, they draft during World War One? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Uh, Galliani, uh, Galliani uh, urged his followers to refuse registration. Uh, June 17th, uh, 1917, federal uh, agents arrested Galliani and charged it with conspiracy. He and eight of his followers were deported to Italy on June 24, 1919. Galeantes were Italian immigrant followers of Galliani, uh, who were inspired by his writings and carried on a series of bombings in April uh, and through June 1919, which is a bit of foreshadowing to the next part of the story. I've got to tell you, the phrase, a series of bombings, yeah. was dropped in there uh, unexpectedly. I was not expecting that. So, okay. Right? A series of bombings. Uh, right. Oh man, I'm I'm falling behind on my pictures here. This guy, yep, that, that's Woodrow. Oh, no. That's Woody. That's Woodrow that's Wilson. Wilson. Sorry, yep. I just uh, just let the, yep. the script up. Sorry. Yep. That, that's, <laughs> that's Woody the Gale man, Gale. Wilson, right there. <laughs> right. There's Galliani. Ah, oh, now that man looks like an Italian anarchist. That's fair. Yes, enough. he does. I get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, during this time, Charles Kaplan, a New York City post office employee, came across sixteen rather nondescript parcels. Uh, nothing stood about these except for the lack of the right amount of postage. Hmm. So Kaplan pushed them to the uh, to one side. Uh, on the train ride home, he saw an article in the newspaper about a package delivered to a Senator Hardwick. Hmm. The Senator's mate opened it and exploded, causing injuries to both the maid and the Senator, realizing uh, this sounded awfully familiar like the packages that he sent aside at the post office. He immediately got off the train and went back to the office where he called the postal inspector as well as the New York City of Combustibles, which is interesting that there is such a bureau. Does it have an anti-bomb department at this stage I, in New York is interesting? Exactly, right? Uh, they inspected the packages and found uh, that they contained incendiary devices. Okay. Uh, they put out an alert immediately because uh, listed on the boxes were people like J.P. Morgan, J.D. Mm. Rockefeller, uh, other politicians, judges, and mayors of New York. Now, let's take a moment and imagine a few of these love letters actually getting to where they could have gone. I'm picturing the last scene of Dr. Strange here, where it's just like <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah. What we learned from this side... For, if, if further commentary, I'm going to exclude. <laughs> okay. For, for any terrorists watching this, always pay the correct postage on your package, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the alert uh, to all U.S. postal uh, offices, offices, as they believe that they uh, had a series of uh, pl uh, bomb plots, they found dozens more packages addressed okay. to politicians, judges, North Carolina and Utah. Around this time, uh, there was a bomb that went off at Wall Street. Is that what we're looking at right now? Yep. The bomb that went off. Yep, well, the aftermath, yeah. So you can yeah, see yeah. a little damage at the end down there. Cool, cool, uh, cool. So a second wave of bombings began uh, in June, and on June 2nd, 1919. Man, when did uh, we get to a point where we said it's okay not to wear a hat? When did exactly. That well, it was it's, it's, so if you ever read any of the stories from back then, if somebody wasn't wearing a hat, it's a part of the story. It's like that there's something. Yeah. Seriously, no, seriously, fantastic, yeah. yes, it, it, it's, it's yeah. such a big deal. My dad yeah. says everybody wore a hat, he said, and everybody used to smoke, and nobody questioned yeah. it. They're all just smoking cigarettes, yeah. right? Mm. Uh, blah 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 blah. Sorry, I lost my spot here. Several much lar uh, larger bombs were detonated by Galliantes in eight American cities, including one that damaged the home of now Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer. Palmer, in Washington, D.C., friend has returned. Yep. Uh, the bomb caused the windows to be blown off his neighbor's home, who just happened to be Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife, Eleanor. Right. Uh, 
at this time. Uh, one Daryl, person. Uh, another, another interesting thing. Do you know what Eleanor Roosevelt's maiden name is? No, I do not. Also Roosevelt. Please continue. Yes, I did know that. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Uh, at least one person was killed in this attack, a night watchman, William Bower. Uh, tensions uh, were raised uh, because it occurred in the capital, of course, right? Of course. Uh, yeah. Flyers declaring war on capitalists uh, in the name of anarchist principles accompanied each bomb and flew everywhere after the bombs went off. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm all for anarchy and so on, but I understand uh -huh. why people would be rattled by a bomb going off and then right? it. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Uh, later, later in June, uh, Palmer told the House uh, Appropriations Committee uh, in his best Colin Powell persona that all evidence promised that radicals would, on, on a certain day, rise up and destroy the government in one fell swoop. He requested an increase of his budget to uh, $2 million from $1.5 uh, to support his investigations, but the Congress limited the increase to only $100,000. That's back when $2 million was a lot of money. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so he starts what is known as the Palmer Raids, right? Uh, initial yeah. raid uh, on anarchist, anarchist groups was uh, done in Buffalo, New York, July, excuse me, 1919. Uh, did not really go well because a federal judge ended up tossing out most of uh, Palmer's case. So the judge ruled that the arrest of the radicals charged under the Civil War uh, era law had proposed transforming the government using free speech rights. Uh, not by violence, simply so being the exact opposite with the of what Palmer said he was going to do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so simply being affiliated with groups does not give cause to arrest. Although this raid was a failure, it showed Palmer how to be more effective. Palmer felt he needed to exploit the more powerful immigration statutes that authorize deportation of alien anarchists, uh, violent or not. To do this, he needed to enlist the corporation a corporation of officials the department of labor uh only the secretary of labor could issue warrants for arrest of alien violations of the immigration act uh so and only he could sign deportation orders following a hearing by any immigration inspector so i've tried try to get out a rabbit hole on this so he's using he's still using the powers given to him by the Sedition and the Espionage Act, right? Sure. He's using them to, to, to conduct surveillance to get to his intel, but he's using that to justify warrants and stuff going through the Department of, the Labor, Department of Labor to fuck these people through the immigration sure. policies. Okay. That's uh, a very so, cynical thing. Yes, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. apologies. I forgot to put up this picture before. This is uh, okay. Palmer's house. Ah, uh, it's it the modest. Front there. Yeah, it does really, right? Mm. Um, <laughs> so our story has many characters, right? Many mm. players in this. But of course, uh, you know, we must talk about our returning champions. And in fact, our returning champion at this time is, of course, J. Edgar Hoover. Hey! I've never seen so, that picture of him. Yeah, he looks real young there, don't he? Yeah. So yeah. in 19, 1913, our, our hero, our beloved J. Edgar, uh, he's only 18 years old. He accepted a job at the Library of Congress. Okay. Uh, he said the experience shaped him uh, and helped him uh, become, you know, what he became eventually for the FBI, he noted uh, in a 1951 letter. Uh, this job trained me in the value of collecting material. It gave me an excellent foundation for my work in the FBI where it been necessary to collate information and evidence. Don't take so, much of the accent, but yeah, cool. Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, August 1, that's why you read all the quotes. <laughs> in, in August 1, uh, 1919, as if by providence, right, Palmer named the 24-year-old J. Edgar Hoover to the head of the new division of the, of the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation, mm. the General Intelligence Division. Ooh, responsibility. This is all pre-FBI and pre-CIA, yep. right? This is what they had yep. instead of FBI and CIA stuff. The Bureau correct, of Investigation sorry. and the General Intelligence Division. Yep. Uh, with responsibilities for investigating radical groups. Now, it seems like he never <laughs> abdicated this kind of authority or this kind of uh -huh. you know job, right? I think he just said, uh, that's what I have to do the rest of my life, go after radicals. Hoover right? started early. Exactly. Uh, Hoover used uh, his attention to detail. Uh, he sharpened as a clerk in the library and created a database of information to identify suspected radicals. Oh, I believe he did. I yeah. believe that. So, uh, 
something else was going on was the Boston police strike uh, in early okay. September. <laughs> Imagine that a, a group of people that like to break up unions have you know having a strike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so great. Uh, anyway, who's gonna break up their strike? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, in early September, uh, they raised further concerns, right? There's a possibility of threats to political and social stability. The Boston police strike attempted to form an umbrella with uh, under the AFL, which is also, I can't understand. What's AFL? Uh, the American Federation of Labor. Okay. Uh, so, again, you know, another union that they would fuck with, but whatever. Okay. So they go, they go on strike. Unfortunately, uh, periods of violence uh, break out in areas where the police are refusing to work because of the strike. Uh, yes. Public starts to turn tables against labor because of this. So, of course, yeah. thank you, thank you, pop. Cops fuck us again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the press blamed Bolshevik revolutionaries for infiltrating the Boston of Police Department. Fucking Russians came in and took their jobs, man. They took mm -hmm. their jobs. Uh, October seventeenth, the Senate passed a unanimous resolution demanding Palmer explain what actions he had or had not taken against radical aliens and what. And this is about the time. That Palmer decides to really get his shit together and act. No, no, no. This is about the time when we do an ad. What? Yeah, we're doing an ad. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. Dude, I All told right. you. I, get, I, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I didn't much. tell you about this particular ad, but I've told you we will be doing ads, and I'm paid to do this, right? I get 10 euros from these people, or I guess dollars where you are, right? Where right. do you think your beer comes from? I know. Huh? Just put beer on your hey, table. Yeah, yeah, but it wasn't like. You didn't put it in Venmo last time, so make sure you get it there next. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. We'll get stuck. I, I've already filed my complaint with HR. That's all. This I'm is not podcast. You'll hear from HR. Fine. Go on. You want to make your HR? Never mind. Um, okay, here we go. This is the ad. Okay, that they paid for. You ready? Yep. Are you tired of being just one kind of American? Do you ever wish you could belong to multiple cultural backgrounds at the same time? Well, no more! Introducing Hyphenated Americans! With Hyphenated Americans, you can embrace complex multicultural identities without any of the hassle. Never been to Ireland? Can't speak Irish? Can't name the president or prime minister or anything at all about Ireland? Can't even find it on a map? No problem! At Hyphenated Americans, we believe in giving you a connection to any heritage you might find exotic and intriguing. Anything's better than just white, right? We have classical combinations such as Irish-American, Italian-American, and Filipino-American. We have some new trendy hyphens like Icelandic-American and South African-American, which again only applies to white people. Show your political leanings with our risky collection, which includes Palestinian-American and Kosovar-American. Order within the next hour using the code word the jib for a discount and one free extra hyphen. You can be Irish-Italian-American or Armenian-Chinese-American. No one cares about your made-up cultural connections and it doesn't matter. Get your hyphens today with hyphenated Americans. Oh, Christ. <laughs> That's where uh, beer started out for the evening. Yes, it did. Uh, okay. Moving right along. You were saying something about Palmer, I believe? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say something about Mr. Palmer. Yeah, there he is. Okay. Yeah, there's the villain. Oh, there he is again, yeah. <clears throat> or a hero, I'm sorry. Or a hero, yeah. Okay, 9 p.m. on November 7th, 1919, a day chosen because it was the second anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. Agents of the Bureau, or, yeah, Bureau of Investigation, together with local police, executed a series of well-publicized and violent raids in 12 cities against the Union of Russian Workers. An anarchist uh, political association of Russian immigrants in the U.S., the raid, raids targeted members of the URW, uh, but anyone associated or just happened to be in the area during these raids were often seized by police. Beatings, torture, and, and other police uh, state intimidation tactics were used that day in order to be cleansed, uh, to cleanse the U.S. of these uh, descent, uh, Cleanse the descent. United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, arrests uh, far exceeded the number of warrants. Shocker. Uh, yeah. Of the just uh, 650 arrests in New York City, the government managed to deport only 43. And remember, are these, are these must be the same warrants that he's getting to the Department of Labor rather than the Department of Justice, right? Right. Yeah. Although, uh, I don't think he got as many at that point. And oh, okay. Some, oh, I'm sorry. We'll see how this plays out. No, you're right. You're right, though. Uh, as Attorney General uh, Palmer was busy with the United Mine Workers at uh, Colstrait in November and December of 1919, Hoover organized the next raids. Oh, the man, they put Hoover in charge. 
That's it. Oh, man. Uh, he persuaded the Department of Labor to ease its in, uh, insistence on promptly altering these arrests of their right to an attorney. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, these are different kind of arrests. So, you know, yeah, the Constitution Miranda, doesn't apply, you know. Uh, instead, Labor issu uh, issued instructions that the, its representatives could wait until after the case against the defendant was established. Uh, quote, in order to protect government interest. So we only bring in the lawyers when we know they'll lose the case. Right. Okay, cool. Good to yeah. know. Thanks. Yeah. I I'm sure this is the only time we'll hear of Jay Edgar, you know, harming somebody so <laughs> <laughs> never, never come up again. Okay, it's not yeah. going to happen. Guys, yeah. it's fine. It's just, he, yeah. he took a risk. He did it once, and he's done now. Right. You know, it, it stays in his closet. That's all further away. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, yeah. Hoover decided to uh, in interpret Labor's agreement uh, to act the uh, act against the Communist Party to include a different organization, the Communist Labor Party. Mm. Uh, finally, despite the fact that the Secretary of Labor, William B. Wilson, a different uh, WW there, insisted mm. that uh, more than membership in an organization was required for a warrant, Hoover worked to find labor officials willing to issue the warrant he wanted. Mm. Now, they were several really specific on how he persuaded these folks. Yeah, but, but the Secretary I, of Labor said don't do it. Yeah. And he got some low-lying guys to do it anyway. Is it fair to speculate? I'm again speculate, though knowing Hoover and know how he got things done. Do you think there might have been some blackmail or some shady shit going on? I was there? gonna say he showed them some photos in an envelope. Yeah, I mean was it like a lot of goat fucking that he was, you know. I don't know. You know like hey, I got, Remember you and a goat? <laughs> yeah, I just gotta wonder. You gotta wonder. Just throw it out there. Let's say that's yeah. what happened. But anyways, uh, you second way of mean, that's not that's not. I mean, you're joking, but that's not entirely beyond the bounds of possibility. No, because based on what we know, that he actually we have evidence that he did throughout yes. his career. You gotta wonder. That's not what he fucking. Presumably, doing right there was a time again. when he did that for the first time. Yeah, uh, the second wave of raids uh, was launched on January second, nineteen twenty. At least 3,000 were arrested. Many others were detained over periods of time. Uh, these large raids included uh, arrests and seizures without warrants, as well as detention in overcrowded, unsanitary holding facilities. Hoover later admitted to uh, clear cases of brutality, which that needs to be framed because I don't think that he his ever phrase? Yes, he said that. He clear admitted case to of brutality. Well, you can imagine yeah. how bad it was if he admitted it. Right? Mm. Uh, one location that was raided in New York City was the Russian People's House. This was the home of the office of the Federation Uni U uh, Feder Federated Union Workers of Russia. It also had a cafeteria and classrooms for Russian immigrants to try to learn English and other skills. It's like a cultural center. Yep. Right. Agents destroyed the house uh, as they raided it, which that was kind of on par with what they did when they did all these raids. They just of course, they're only Russians, right? They're uh, not real people. Yeah, exactly. Right? They don't give a shit. You know, these are yeah, these are not real Americans. So that's how they treated. They're all not these real things. Americans. Yeah. Yep, that's how they saw them. Right? Uh, uh, they were uh, there were reports of beatings of anyone the police came in contact with. <laughs> I'm glad that's changed. Uh, mm -hmm. Folks on the upper floor were pushed downstairs, uh, met with billy clubs and fists. Uh, the raid covered uh, more than 30 cities and towns in 23 states. So it's much larger scale than what Palmer did alone before, right? Yeah. Uh, but these, uh, but those went uh, west of the Mississippi and south of Ohio were considered to be uh, publicized gestures designed to make an effort to appear nationwide. So, you know. It's really just like New York and Pennsylvania, is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because the raids uh, targeted entire organizations, uh, agents arrested uh, everyone found in organizations, meeting halls, including non-affiliated visitors and sometimes even American citizens, as in the non-hyphenated ones, yeah. uh, for arrest and deportation. Uh, the next well, day, the, but the the, the um, an established American citizen like that would not, be, you would not be able to get a Department of Labor warrant for them. Exactly, they're arrested they're just, anyway. Yeah, they just were grabbing people, man. Basically, well, that's going to get thrown out there. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the next day in Bridgeport, Connecticut, a meeting of Russian immigrants uh, were meeting to discuss the purchase of a vehicle, uh, and that place again was raided. Uh, there was only 63 warrants, but 93 people were arrested. So they magicked up 30 yep. arrests with no warrants. Yep. Okay. Uh, by December, most of these people were deported uh, to Russia on a ship nicknamed the Red Ark. The Red Ark. Yeah, that's that's okay. something, man. 
that's fucking something. Uh, the Department of Justice at, uh, at one point. Actually, you know what? That's kind of reaching the point of sarcasm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at one point, claimed uh, to have taken possession of several bombs. Oh. Uh, but after a few iron uh, balls were displayed to the press, they were never mentioned again. So they probably weren't ball bombs. Uh, okay. All the raids uh, netted a total of just four pistols. That's that's an arsenal, man. Four pistols. No wonder they're scared of these fuckers, right? They're going to take over the a, world. I have a friend who lives in Texas who's got more than that in his house. Right. So do I. I got more than that in the next room. You've got you know? more than that in your house. Yes. Okay. Are you yeah. a hyphenated American? <laughs> we'll talk later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, France or, uh, Francis Fisher Kane, I was a king at the end of it, uh, the U.S. Attorney uh, of the East, Eastern District of Pennsylvania resigned in protest. In a letter of resignation to the president and the attorney general, he wrote, do uh, you want to take a stab at this? this? Yeah, okay, please. now this is going to sound a lot like Wilson and Roosevelt, <laughs> okay? But I need you to work with me. This is Francis Fisher okay. Kane, a U.S. Attorney, from, uh, U.S. attorney in Pennsylvania. It seems to me that the policy of raids against large numbers of individuals is generally unwise and apt to result in injustice. People not really guilty are likely to be arrested and railroaded through their hearings. We appear to be attempting to repress a political party. By such methods, we drive underground and make dangerous what was not dangerous before. That's a good point, you makes, I think. Yep. I agree with uh, that. Palmer replied that this could uh, could not be uh, yeah could not use individual arrests to treat a, a, an epidemic, and asserted that his own uh, fidelity to constitutional principles. He added, "You want to?" I should warn you. This is going to sound a bit like Roosevelt, Wilson, <laughs> and Francis Fisher Kane, an attorney in Pennsylvania, but this is a different person called Palmer, right? Uh huh. Uh -huh. The government, sorry, can everybody listening to this on the audio? The government should encourage free political thinking and political action, but it certainly has the right for its own preservation to discourage and prevent the use of force and violence to accomplish that which ought to be accomplished, if at all, by parliamentary or political methods. The if at all there is quite telling, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like saying, you know, if a lot of people want to do this thing, should they really be doing it? No. Use the correct channels. That's, by the way, People who don't want something to happen will tell you, make sure you use the correct channels. No matter right. what it is. There, that's yeah. a person who does not want that thing to happen. Yep. People who say, oh, now's not the right time. Now's never yes. going to be the right time for these people. Just Thank do it. You. Anyway, sorry, go on. That was no, you're, no, you're correct. You're correct. Uh, most uh, press coverage continued to be positive with criticism only of leftist uh, publications like The Nation and The New Republic. Washington Post endorsed Palmer's claim uh, uh, for urgency over a legal uh, process. Uh, there is no time to waste on hair splitting over infringement of liberty. Clash classic Washington Post, there, right? Let's just let's just look at the sentence they said again. This is in the mm -hmm. Washington Post. Yep. There is no time where, to waste. Where democracy on dies on the dark. Where right? democracy <laughs> dies. There is no time to waste on hair splitting over infringement of liberty. Yeah. Like what? Well, that's that's Hitler logic. Like yeah. I don't like in, invoking Godwin's law, but like that is Hitler <laughs> logic. We don't have time to waste on hair splitting over legal rights and what people are entitled to. You know? Yeah, we do. There's always time. Okay. It's, it's fucking bleak, man. Yeah. Early in March uh, 1920, the temporary absence of Secretary of Labor William B. Wilson and the recent resignation of uh, the department's solicitor in general made Lewis Freeland Post the department's acting secretary and the key person responsible for the Bureau of Investigations, or sorry, Bureau of Immigration. Unlike his predecessor, you could say that Post was not on Team Palmer. Hey! He canceled more than 2,000 warrants, uh, considering them illegal. Hey! Uh, he canceled 2,000 warrants. Yeah. yeah, he did. All right, of, go of the 10, <laughs> Of the 10,000 arrested, uh, 35 were being held by authorities in detention. 556 uh, resident uh, aliens were eventually deported. Yeah, I have another picture here. Okay. What are we looking at? There's some of the folks there at Alice Island waiting to get shipped They're deported. out. Yep. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, at a cabinet meeting in April 1920, Palmer called the Secretary of Labor, William B. Wilson, to fire post. Uh, but Wilson defended him. Uh, the president listened uh, to his feuding departments, as in that Wilson, as in uh, 
you know, would he or yeah. won't he, right? Uh, Hence, uh, offered no comment about the about post, but he ended the meeting by telling Palmer that he should not let the country turn red. Okay. Yeah. Boy, that, that's like saying something out loud, right? Yeah. Uh, Palmer's supporters and Congress. Wait now, wait now. So he's the president is basically telling Palmer he, he should go for it. It sounds like yeah, he's basically like okay. still endorsing him, right? Mm. Uh, Palmer supporters in Congress uh, responded with an attempt to impeach or uh, at least censor Post. The movement against Post began to lose steam when Palmer's uh, forecasted r- radical uprising on May Day, 1920, uh, did not happen because he claimed that uh, you know this was going to you know be the revolution, right? right? Yep. Uh, yeah, with their four guns that we took. Right? <laughs> four yeah. pistols. They're going to take yeah. over the country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then, in testimony before the House Rules of Committee in May, uh, Post uh, proved a convincing speaker with a caustic tongue. Defended himself uh, so successfully, a longtime Palmer uh, supporter, Congressman uh, Edward uh, W. Poe, congratulated him. I feel that you have followed your sense of duty absolutely. Okay. On May 28th, 19, uh, 1920, the American Civil Liberties Union, otherwise known as the ACLU, was founded in a direct response against these raids. I did not know they that. Published, yep, they published its report upon the illegal practices of the United States Department of Justice, which carefully documented unlawfully activities and the arresting suspe- uh, suspected radicals, including illegal entrapment and uh, unlawful incommunicative detention. Many prominent lawyers and law professors signed it, including Harvard professor uh, Zachary Sheffe criticized uh, the raids and the lack of legal process in his 1920 volume, Freedom of Speech. He wrote, uh, would you like to read this here? Okay, I should warn you, it's going to sound like Wilson, <laughs> Roosevelt, Palmer, and a lawyer in Pennsylvania, okay? Yeah. Uh-huh. That a Quaker should employ prison and exile to counteract the evil thinking is one of the saddest ironies of our time. Uh, the Rules Committee gave Palmer a hearing, and in June, where he was attacked by Post, other critics uh, whose... Uh, Tender solicitude for social revolution and perverted sympathy for the criminal anarchists set at large among the people, the very public enemies, whom it was the desire and intention of the Congress to be rid of. The press saw the, the dispute as evidence of Wilson's administration ineffectiveness as it approached its final like months. Ducting. Yeah. Uh, June twentieth, a decision by the Massachusetts District uh, Court Judge George W. Anderson ordered the discharge of seventeen arrested aliens and denounced the Department of Justice actions. He wrote that uh, a mob is a mob, whether it is made up of the government officials acting under instruction for the Department of Justice or of criminals and loafers in the in the vicious classes. Uh, his decision effectively prevented any renewal of the raids. So that stopped that, right? A mob uh, is a mob where they're made up of government officials under instructions from the Department of Justice or a bunch of criminals. Yep. Well, now can we have more of that maybe, yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Palmer, uh, once seen as a likely presidential candidate, lost his bid to win the Democratic nomination as president uh, later that year. Uh, it was believed basically because of all this stuff, right? Yeah. All the Palmer raids. Uh, which also, coincidentally... Uh, who was rewarded for all of his good deeds was Hoover. This is how he got the gig for the FBI. Almost, mm. Yeah, directly from doing all this stuff. Uh, but uh, our, our dear hero, uh, one more look at this uh, wonderful piece of shit. He died May 11th, 1936 uh, in Washington, D.C. from a cardiac complications following an epidemic to me uh, two weeks earlier. Uh, the anarchist bombing campaign continued intermittently for another 12 years. An estimated 10,000 arrests were made, and about 800 people were eventually deported, including Emma Gold, uh, Goldman, uh, noted anarchist. Uh, during the violent raids, a uh, which would be considered a moment of national hysteria. Ooh, how about that? So, yeah. And uh, that's it, man. That's it on the Palmer raids. Kind, kind of fucked up. Yes. You might kind say. Kind of fucked up, but we've got some great quotes in there. Well, I'm glad we stopped doing read. this stuff. I'm glad we stopped, you know, uh, you know, illegally surveilling people, 
uh, that we stopped uh, fucking with people about immigration mm. and stuff, and that we're, we're pro labor. I'm glad all these yes. things have changed. Yes, the cops don't act like a criminal gang anymore. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, it's all changed so much. Let's let's see yeah. um, let's see what's happening this week. Okay. What's new? There's two words. I'll have to do what's new. Never mind. One. Yeah. So uh, this this is the part of the show. If you're new to the show, this is the part of the show. We put, uh, me and Seamus, put FBI and CIA into Google, and we hit the news tab, and we pick stories we think might be interesting, but we don't tell each other about it beforehand. So this is going to come as a surprise to, to everyone. Whatever whatever Seamus says next, because Seamus is on FBI detail as far as I know, and I'll just CIA yep. after. Okay, what do you got? Okay, uh, so basically... The first two stories are basically the same thing about the uh, FBI broke uh, the rules. Uh, uh, yeah, surprise, right? They broke the rules about uh, surveillance, foreign intelligence, uh, also including uh, the January 6th riot, the BLM riots, and other things. There's a whistleblower that came out. What did they claim? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, today's ju uh, Judicial Committee, Select Committee, on the weaponized of the federal government released the interim uh, FBI whistleblower testimony highlights government abuse, misallocation of resources, and retaliation, detailing erogenous problems uh, infecting the senior leadership ranks of the FBI. Oh, wow. Whistleblower disclose, disclosures uh, from rank and file agents' employees reveal recurring theme of abuse, misallocations of resources, and retaliatory conduct. Yeah. Um, the FBI as a cancerous. Ooh, there's a lot of systematic uh, culture of unaccountability. Yeah. Well, that's always yeah. the case. With the... I mean, that's it's that's been since its inception, mm -hmm. right? So I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I yeah. Play, imagine. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so a lot going on in both of those stories. All the basically same thing. Uh, also, there's a lawsuit. Uh, FBI failed to protect a man uh, slain amid uh, Tennessee political scandal decades ago. Uh, I guess this guy was a key witness against Tennessee governor's administration. He got killed? He got killed. And oh. uh, it sounds like the FBI screwed up in, in doing yeah. this. Uh, Samuel Pettyjohns, I guess is the guy's name. Right, Samuel. Got killed. Samuel will not so. be testifying at that trial. No, he will not. So. Mm. So, yep, uh, that's what I got. For, oh, uh, well, I don't know. I'll let you do the CIA one because I think we are sort of talking about one that are related. Oh, related that's the one we were talking about before. I'll do the CIA yeah. ones first. Yeah, go ahead. Then I'll okay. do it. Or I this can try it if you want went. Um, CIA launches video to recruit Russian spies. The Central Intelligence Agency <laughs> has launched a new effort to capitalize on what U.S. intelligence officials believe is an unprecedented opportunity to convince Russians disaffected by the Ukrainian war and life in Russia to share their secrets posting a slickly produced cinematic recruitment video online on Monday. So you can check that story out if you if you want to laugh. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's the one I wanted to kind of refer to because there's an article saying who does it better uh, because oh. the FBI is also trying to recruit. Well, they're doing the same thing. Oh, yeah. Stuff. But yeah. when the CIA is recruiting yeah. Russians, at least they know they're recruiting Russians. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the FBI yeah. it comes as a surprise yeah. 30 years later when yeah. they get activated. Yeah. Right? Um, another second one says uh, Russian fury over CIA uh, campaign. Um, a, yeah, this is uh, the wrong story, but the Russians are very angry uh, about the CIA campaign to recruit Russians, and also they have a bizarre copycat video out, which is another story you should check out. That's the third great. link I have is um, GOP committee chair demands documents from CIA related to public statement from ex-Intel officials questioning Hunter Biden laptop story. Now. The Hunter, first of all, the fact that the Hunter Biden laptop story is a story, and I, I mean, do you give a shit about this thing? Like, if the guy has criminal stuff on his laptop, fucking charge him with something. Right. Because if he doesn't it, shut it, up. Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, and let's, and, and, well, I have to huge That guy's got weird shit on his media. laptop, and it's like national security stuff. Fine, arrest him and put him in yeah. jail. <laughs> no problem uh, you, with that. You know, and as far as the, the children and the relatives, Oh of all the the presidents, ex presidents, yeah. ex vice presidents, whatever, rest them all. Make my day. They, they're all. I'm not saying okay. I don't think the Obama kids did anything bad, or the Bush kids did anything bad. Uh, uh, but you know, definitely uh, 
fucking Trump and Biden. Yeah, but kids, then charge you know. those people too. Like I wouldn't treat. Them yeah. Like yeah. Exactly. Rest them all. In fact, rest anybody with the la those last names. I'm going to be happy. Okay. Don't uh, you know? Don't fool me with it. You know, start me with a good time. You know. And it says. <laughs> And it says here, if the CIA does not comply with the request by May 30, the committees uh, may resort to compulsory process. And I would like to yeah. see the CIA being subpoenaed. That's going right. to be interesting, isn't it? Yeah. They won't get anywhere near them. You know, <laughs> they'll set landmines down before they'll do that. What was it the, the the claim that they were trying to, that the FBI was trying to, like, blow smoke over all this so it didn't come up during the election? I don't know. I think that's, one, whole, of the, I think that's one of the claims. It seems like, it seems like weak sauce to me. Yeah. There might be something. Do you think they'd find something by now if there was something in it? Yeah. And that's what I understood about this whole, like, you know, the collusion thing. You know, well, if they've been involved with enough, right? You know, for the fact that uh, fucking Jared was dealing with the Saudis and making money. Yeah, I mean, but that, that, that touches. Well, I'll say this but for you Trump. But you, can't, but, can't, but you can't do that because how many other people in, in the Senate yes. and Congress I'll are. I'll say this for Trump. Any, any, <laughs> yeah. corrupt, any corruption or stuff he's getting involved with, he does brag about it. And it's not like a yeah. question of keeping it a secret. So I kind of, I mean, there's a different. He put it on Twitter saying, oh, you wouldn't believe the corrupt thing I got away with today, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, yeah, but it just tells you the nature of what's really going on in that fucking system. Yeah. Pool. So, it's fucking Let's terrible. That's my CIA links. All right. Well, that, that that's our, I think that's our show. And, and I hate both parties, by the way, in case you, people thought I'd done otherwise. I, I hate everything and everyone. Parties. Yeah. So. All right. Thanks, All right, everybody. folks. We'll, we'll see you all here in two weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye.